All right. Well, well, thank you. Um, we might get a start. So, um, I'm Gary Baker, and uh, currently the uh, uh, president, chairman of the Anabaptist Association of Australia and New Zealand, and uh, I've been in involved with that association since its origin. And um, I thought that we that uh, today we'd just um, perhaps um, have uh, some background to to the association, but, but extending a bit into what Anabaptist is or has been, and then uh, perhaps coming up to the current time and then looking at the future. So I was going, I was hoping to get some uh, assistance <laughs> as, as we as we embark on this on this journey. Um, okay, so um, just just briefly, my uh, involvement with uh, uh, Anabaptist Anabaptist was in, in America where I became a member of a, a small um, congregation in Durham, North Carolina back in the, um, 19, uh, the late 80s and I was, doing some, uh, I was doing some research work in America for a couple of years. I've come from, I come from Sydney and I've uh, come back here. And, um, and, and part of that was I had never heard of um, Anabaptist. Um, until I went, and it, and it, uh, it was actually a, a, an interesting experience because I, um, I wasn't really, I wasn't a Christian when I went to America, and I, but I, I was uh, perhaps uh, receptive uh, to some of the things that the um, Anabaptist uh, Church was about, and I, I remember seeing a little article in the local library, just which outlined a community of faith who, which, which went through some of those main. Uh, points of um, the Anabaptism and perhaps the, the Bread of Community, which uh, Bill and Grace have been uh, talking about. And I went along to join that community. And uh, I was very nervous, and uh, I was met at the door by a, uh, a chap called Mr. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he introduced me to the, the minister there, John Angel. And I, I sort of almost <laughs> said, all right, <laughs> I'll, I'll disappear. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I got to know those people, and in fact, they, I thought they were all very appropriately named <laughs> in the end. And I became a member of that community, and I, uh, I was transformed and baptised into that community. And, uh, but then I've come back to Australia. So just in Anab the Anabaptist does mean really uh, rebaptism, and it's a, it's a term that uh, was uh, given to... Um, a group of um, Christians in uh, Switzerland, or, or Switzerland and, and Germany, um, uh, and uh, it was a term because at that stage um, we're talking about the uh, early uh, 16th century, 1525, uh, that sort of time, and uh, these these people um, had um, got hold of a, um, a German New Testament Bible. Uh, and Luther <laughs> had uh, translated uh, the Bible into German, and he'd start off with the New Testament. And uh, and uh, some of these chaps were quite learned. They'd some been, some had been to the university, but others hadn't. But they got to reading, and uh, they were struck by the uh, disconnection between what they read in the New Testament in the Gospels and what what the church was doing. And not only what the church was doing, but also what the church was at that stage was transforming to be, because it, the, uh, there was, we're in the midst now of Luther had, you know, pinned his theses in uh, 1517. Actually, it's 500 years in October from when that, that thesis got pinned on the wall. But then there was a lot of debate going on in the, in the town, and, and this was in Zurich that uh, I had. I've actually been to Zurich, and I've been to the place of Conrad Gable, who was uh, one of the chaps who. Um, was uh, instrumental in saying, "Hey, look, this Jesus, Jesus here. This, this is what we're doing is not what is what has been said, but written about." And um, so uh, uh, they came together and then uh, decided that the uh, that really. The transformation 
called on by following Jesus and, and meeting God and being with God that way and entering the kingdom of God was not what, what had been said. So uh, they undertook a, a baptism and uh, that was in uh, 25th of January, uh, 21st of January, yeah. <laughs> 1525, yeah, and uh, uh, in, you know, in, in Zurich, and that, uh, that then quickly, uh, there was quickly that this spread amongst other people in the Zurich, but it caused a lot of opposition, uh, because at that stage, the, uh, this, this, it was against the law to be rebaptized because people were baptised at birth, and that was, um, that was part of the political structure. You then got taxed. <laughs> Everyone knew what was going on. These people were revolutionary because they were, were, were re-baptising. Not, not, not in the sense that they knew about, really, but it was a revolution, but it was... Um, anyway, so they got persecuted. And uh, the, um, uh, to the extent that uh, a number of those early... Uh, um, uh, Anabaptists were put to death in various forms and that, that uh, the martyring was I think over a period of that century was perhaps um, over 4,000 4, and we, we do have a record of that because there's a, in, a, a Dutchman I think yeah, the Martyr's Mirror <laughs> actually kept a record of what was happening and not only a record of what was happening but what the people were who were getting martyred were saying and, 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 and writing at that time in that situation. Um, and that was, that was quite extraordinary. And there's also, the other thing there's, is that the Martyr's Mirror also gave us engravings, pictures of people from that period. And there's a, there's a picture on the website of the Anabaptist Association of um, Dirk Wilms, who um, was being, uh, had been imprisoned because of uh, his um, um, uh, becoming a member of this uh, new church. And uh, he, was, he had escaped. And as he escaped, he was running across the ice and the people uh, were chasing him. One chap fell, he threw the ice into the water. And this chap turned around because he was concerned about him, this man who was chasing him, rescued him. And that man who rescued him then subsequently took him off to get killed. And it's, I mean, that picture is such a dramatic picture because Gurk Wilhelms loved his enemy. And, and how does this man, I, mean, I don't know about whether he, this chap was literate or what, or had been a university or what, or was a farmer, I don't know what, what, what he was, but this is a person who had understood Christ's message to the extent that he lived it. So the um, early Anabaptists were um, um, uh, found their strength in coming together in communities. And those communities then started migrating away from the places that they were being uh, martyred. And uh, one of those places was in the, uh, this, the, the, it's the mountains on the corner of uh, Switzerland and France called the Jura Mountains. They're not as high as the Alps, but they're quite high. And that was a wasteland. And uh, some of those people were, uh, were, were allowed, they'd reached an agreement with the, the Bishop of Basel or somewhere to, to go up into these mountains and live there. And they went up there and through, as a community, through hard work, they, they were able to make it successful. They grew potatoes and they adapted to the cold climate and they had an agriculture that was possible. They came together. And, and when I went over there in 2009, they're still there. Those communities are still there. Now, what is also still there is the Bible. The, uh, the German Bible that was translated and printed. There's a printed copy in that in, in a cellar in the little, they have an archive of materials in this church. 
And I actually saw the Bible that they had held for over four centuries. It's still there. The, I mean, people migrated uh, to other, to far down the Rhine, uh, into uh, Holland and Germany, up the coast of Germany, and then into Russia. And of course, then we know about the uh, when America was settled, there was a um, a number of Anabaptists went into America, and then subsequently, when further persecution in Russia, people moved into Canada, and um, and then there's been you know, much more movement of the Anabaptist people um, in, from America onwards. But one of, the, one of the really interesting things, though, was that if you look at the New Testament and you read the New Testament, then it's quite clear that the first Christians also <laughs> understood what, what it was to be a Christian. And in the early Christians, the, the, we, we saw the Anabaptists kind of went through what had happened in the early Christianity, where people came together in a community, and a, as described, why it's so important with those verses that um, um, Bill and Grace were talking about. But they understood, and they became uh, Christians who were able to love their enemies. And in, I think there are three elements that, that were uh, apparent um, in not only the Anabaptists but the early Christians was, the, was Jesus announcing shalom, the presence of shalom now. The kingdom was here. God was here. God was a living God. God was present. And the Spirit of God, Spirit of Jesus, could be within the individual. Jesus outlined a way of prayer. He also outlined a life, a life how to live. And we've got the Sermon on the Mount, Beatitudes. And there's people who have actually taken that and lived it. Now, I guess the one question is, is the message is there, but, the, but if, we, if we look at the, the idea of um, information, information systems, there, there has been, I mean, Jesus would have spoken his thing orally, the, his, his teachings orally, the, the people around him, though, not only, not only received the information orally, but they saw him alive. And, and they were then able to communicate to others what that happened. And then sometimes later, there was a written record made. But the, that written record was in um, uh, Latin, Greek. And that, was, uh, and that was handwritten, so it wasn't available for many years apart from select people. But then in the uh, 1500s, a printer by name of Gutenberg came up with print and printed the Bible for the first time. And of course then, that was in, uh, in a language which perhaps these uh, people in Zurich could not, couldn't read, but then Luther had translated that Bible and that had been then printed and that printing, printing was then available. So, but yet, and then those people got to this, this record of what Jesus had, had said and what he had done. And they were able to, to read that and then they were transformed. That, that's amazing that, that the meaning in that information that had to go through all that transformation to get to those people was still so powerful that that transformed them. It, it, and, but the other thing is that around them was a church, a church which had somehow was different, <laughs> a church that actually decided 
that it was important to kill these people for its own sake. So you had, in fact, although that information was available, there, there was noise that got into the system. The information transfer, either through the, the deliberate in, in, encoding or noise in the system, intentional or whatever, had changed it. So the message never got decoded properly and for a whole lot of time. And I, and I think that, that is, that's a really uh, interesting thing. Because now, here, now, we, we are in a, we're in a much different age for information. Information transfer is, is almost instantaneous. Some people think now <laughs> that the world, more people have access to a mobile phone than fresh water. I find, I find that amazing throughout the world. And many of those people now can see, they compare their lifestyle with what's, what's portrayed in the media. They can see a huge inequality. Why is that? But, the, but the, now the information has, <coughs> has, has changed very dramatically. So I think that often the, the the problem has been getting the information transferred in integrity, but the other side of it is also what does it mean? What does the information mean? And it is a, it's a difficult business, and I didn't understand it, but when I was in that community in North Carolina, my wife and I had our, our son there, and he had a health problem. And newborn baby, you know, we were aliens to the culture, we were in a different country. And, and I, all I can say is I thought, I, you know, God has led me to this group because they came around and cared for us and comforted us and, and in fact, prepared us because the, the baby looked like it was going to die. So we had this extraordinary experience of people who came around and supported us. And I, and I didn't know there was a church like that. I didn't know there were people in church who did that. So when we so coming back to Australia, and um, I thought other people have to know about Anabaptist Christianity. I mean, goodness me! <laughs> but I'd never heard of it in Australia, and and there were Australians who had heard of it because then I found that there were people who were who were um, um, receptive to to this whole area, and um, but there was there was only a very small amount, and then uh, but there had been an attempt of Anabaptists to come to Australia to, um, to bring um, uh, uh, the message. And there had been a missionary um, uh, who went to, um, out to Western Australia. And um, um, that was back in the 70s, I think? 80s. 80s, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, the, um, so then, then the opportunity, uh, Mark and Mary came out uh, under this it was an arrangement with um, Foppy Brown, who formed an evangelical Mennonite church in, uh, uh, at uh, Lake Macquarie, Newcastle. And uh, Foppy and Alice had uh, formed a relationship with the um, World Mennonite Conference and had actually attracted some uh, funding uh, from, I think, from Europe and then subsequently the United States for, um, for people to come out, missionaries to come out. And Mark and Mary came out in the uh, 19... 1990. 1990. Okay, it was 1990. And uh, fortunately, we were there and uh, were able to welcome, <laughs> welcome them in, welcome, and, uh, and get settled in, 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 in Sydney. And, um, and then we, uh, we had a small fellowship group and then... But, how do you tell people about this? How do we, how do we increase this information? So the, um, there was lots of problems then because you were aliens and you couldn't get a passport, couldn't stay very long, and so this, this issue became a major issue. So in the, um, in the uh, 1990s, early 1990s, we thought uh, we formed a network of Anabaptists, so there was a, a bit of information going around because, as you remember, 
in uh, information technology, by the late 80s, the internet had sort of had come up. And, and so what, even though we didn't, we didn't use that a lot in the mid-90s, that, that was sort of becoming available. Anyway, we had a, we had a, um, a meeting, a network meeting in Sheffield in uh, Tasmania, uh, where a number of people came together. Uh, Chris Marshall uh, was, uh, came uh, over from New Zealand and, and gave some very um, inspiring um, ministry. Uh, but, and a lot of others, uh, people were around. I don't know whether, was Tim Costello there at the time? I don't know, but uh, there were. And anyway, the decision was to form an association, an association of Australian, the Anabaptist Association of Australia and New Zealand. And uh, that it was going to be a way of bringing uh, information about Anabaptism uh, into the Australian New Zealand country. And, uh, and that was subsequently formed. It was, uh, took a number of years to form. Um, and, that, and it was mainly, it was going, mainly just going to act as an information uh, vehicle. It also was a network of bringing people together from the, just so they knew of each other. It wasn't a church. It wasn't going to be a community at say, per se, but it was going to be a vehicle for that. And so um, the... Um, uh, but one of the things that was important was actually, and it actually proved to be a useful vehicle, because we had to make an application for why Mark and Mary were, could come to Australia. And, and with those immigration laws at that stage, it was quite difficult if you didn't have money. If you were business people, no problem. But if you weren't business people, you had to find a unique niche. Well, of course, it was easy in Australia, because Mark and Mary, Anabaptism wasn't even in the vocabulary in Australia. So, we could, find a, we could find a unique niche. And so the Anabaptist Association was initially the, an entity that could employ people to come here. But it also, we started a newsletter and then we started a website and, and, and these things have, have sort of been timid steps but, and have been growing. Uh, and it's in, in 1998 it was formed and it, so it's been, um, uh, it's incorporated. Or, or what's it? No, no, it's not incorporated. It's, uh, it's a, um, a legal entity. It's not a charity, but it's a legal entity as an association. Um, and um, I thought, well, the other thing I was just <laughs> wanting to say is that there's a, it was an interesting discussion in the last workshop about how does um, reaching out in the world I, I personally think that we're in a situation of, we're in a crisis point in, and it's happened while the association was in its being. It's, uh, you know, the, the Euros, um, we've got now, we, we're not far from Australia's nuclear reactor at Lucas Heights, it's just over there a bit. <laughs> we're probably in the, the boundary area a bit, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, man has now got <laughs> weapons that could destroy all life. And I, I mean, we all worry a bit about this. I grew up in the 50s, and listening to the radio at that stage, we were, we were being threatened by the Cold War. And I, I, and I, I think that was a, a very scary time to grow up about the possibility of us all being an, annihilated, because there were stories on the radio about that very thing happening. And so it's kind of been <laughs> embedded in me a bit, the potential that we could be, we could be destroyed. But it's not only that. Of course, now we've got, you know, we face other, other sorts of problems of, you know, biological decimation. We can get Ebola virus or something and we can all fizzle out. Or uh, climate change, which is going to just change dramatically how we live. Or the demographics purely of the earth, you know, 7 billion people and multiplying even further. And of course, the environmental degradation that's leading, has, has a, so we're facing a, a terrible time. And I guess the other thing is that there's a, an enormous inequity in the world. Inequity. People, you know, still, still dying from hunger. Still, you know, it's, it's huge. But those people have got mobile phones. And they can see what Mr Trump's going to do or what, you know, such and such is going to do. They all see that. Uh, so um, I think the... Uh, if we come back to the association, we, we have had some very uh, worthwhile conferences over the last 
um, almost um, well from '98, so it's a 20 years. But it's, yeah, so and in fact, the, the the last conference we had here, from pieces to pieces, where we looked at other faith traditions and and extraordinary. Uh, Dave Andrews talked about the central tenet of those other religions mainly was the same as what Jesus has said. You know, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. That's, that's the central tenet. The Anabaptists were able to translate and saw that that meant, from an from a Australian Anabaptist point of view, caring, sharing, and peace. But putting those three things together hadn't been done before by any of the other churches. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. But yet, yet actually living that way, living that way, and overcoming our sort of, you know, our basic egocentric desires, but be able to overcome that in a way that we can experience joy and peace in ourselves by doing that is something that people haven't known how to do. But in the Anabaptists, there, there is. And it's been really refreshing to, to, on this talk about community because in community where the people come together, you can develop that and you can have that. So I think the, uh, so whilst the Anabaptist Association of Australia New Zealand can help that information transfer to, to get the coding right and the decoding get rid of the noise so that there's a meaning, the meaning is still there from the information. You still need people to actually help other people understand it and to live it. And that's, that's that if there's, if there's, a, if there's a, um, a rate limiting step in reaching the seven billion people in the world, it's going to be that transfer of the message at that personal level. Now, um, I, I, I guess I haven't asked for questions, but I, oh, comments? Mark, Mary? Um, just a couple comments about AAA and Z and how it's developed over, over the years. One of our problems right off the bat was the large territory that we were taking on with, with Australia and, and New Zealand. Uh, when we would have our early executive uh, meetings, we had six time zones we had to cover, and so we had uh, people in New Zealand, people in Perth, and trying to find ways to meet. So distance has always been a challenge um, for us here. The other thing is um, we started off with this information, and so books and a number of our members uh, were professors in theological colleges, universities. So. Um, we were very heavy on the theology and the information uh, to the point that some people felt that if they weren't an academic, they couldn't be an Anabaptist. Um, and so we've had to learn from that. Uh, recently I had a conversation with someone and, and he, just, he just felt that he wasn't academically enough astute to be an Anabaptist. And, he was, and, and I got to thinking, and in other places around the world, Anabaptists are known for their service. And uh, when we first came here, people, if they had heard about Mennonites, often it was they were someplace in the developing world and they met some Mennonite Central Committee workers who were out there serving. And I got to thinking about our, when Mary and I, we weren't raised Mennonites, but we, we joined the Mennonite church and we, we started looking around and everybody our age had done at least two years of alternative or, or voluntary service somewhere in the world. And so that service aspect is a very big aspect of the, the, the washing the feet of others and serving others in the name of Christ. But because um, we have been so small and, and we've started with the information and, and the academics, we haven't really um, pushed that aspect of Anabaptism. And part of what you need for that is communities because the service grows out of communities. So for a number of years now, there have been people in our network that are saying what we need to be about. Yes, it's good going into theological schools, universities, doing that educating at the, at the academic level. But we need to have models of what we're talking about. We need to have 
churches, fellowships, table fellowships, uh, forming intentional uh, communities where people can, we can point to it and say, this is what it looks like. You know, not just a book, but this is actually how you live out this kind of faith. So that's been a challenge for us. We've had, um, we had a community in Perth that was going for a while, and uh, like many communities, you know, they hit rocky patches and, and they dispersed. Uh, we had a, a community here in, in Sydney that was uh, going for a while, and for a number of reasons that had to break up. So that- Gary I think, moved away. <laughs> well, I was thinking about a later, later community too. But I think that's one of the cutting edges for us for the future. Um, and, and so that people can actually see this is a way of life. It's not just a way of, of thinking and doing theology, but it is really a way of life. So I think the challenge for us is to form communities where people are, are living out this faith and can model it for others. And we have, I mean, this weekend we have uh, other communities here that are modeling that in the way they're living. And so that's part of what we want to do into the future is find ways of building community. Um, one of the reasons we, we invited Enton here, um, he's doing community building online. And we looked at that and said, well, because of the distances that we have here, are there ways of using uh, the modern technology uh, where, you know, the Anabaptists in the 15th century, they were using the printing press and stuff, getting that out. Well, now we have the internet and people connecting through social media. How can we use that as a way of getting out this Anabaptist Christian message. So we want to explore some of that. Um, so that's some of the, the cutting edge stuff for, for us at this point. Yeah, it's the, I, I don't think we have a voice unless we live a life that's different. And, and how do we model that? How do we model that before the world? Um, and how, because once again, even with the Anabaptists, even though they had the printing press and they had the word, they also were known for their life and the fact that they were sacrificial in the way they lived in the same way that Jesus gave his life to work at that. And, and he lived a life before them. You know, this is a different way of being. So I think that calls us to live a life that's different. Um, it's so easy for us to just slip into being like everybody else. And so there's no need for them to say, why are you different? And then we don't have any need to speak about the hope that's within us because we've shut that down. We don't look any different. We don't act any different. Why? So what? Um, and so I think part of it is we have to live a life that's different. And then when people come and say, why do you do that? Then with gentleness, we say, this is the hope. This is where we are. This is why we do this. You can connect with God too you can connect with this spirit that can live within us and motivate us to care and be there for other people um, in a variety of ways. Is there any questions that, um, I, I don't know how we're going for time, but. Um, community can be a variety of ways. You do not have to live on top of each other in each other's you know, pocket to have community. Um, and so part of it is what can community look like? Um, and part of it is how do we support each other? We gather, like I was thinking about Neil's ability to create, they're creating this community that don't really live next door to each other. Um, we're part of Wellspring but there's no one else in our area that's, but yet we still feel the support of that community. So how do we go about doing that? And I think the other thing is, how do we end up serving? Because I think part of it is, it's not just what we say, that the church has been doing a lot of that. How do we do that life? How do we serve each other and the community and the world, you know, the entire environment? How do we do that? 
Um, and I think that for me is as much as anything else. The other thing too, um, and this is one of the reasons why uh, we've, our last conference was four years ago instead of two. We, as an association, we're working at the issue of generational change. Um, if you look up here at us, we're, we're all in our 60s, and, and many of the people who started the, the Anabaptist Association are in, the, in their 60s. And so, so we, were, we were saying, how do we, is this going to be a one generation movement? Um, how do we bring on younger generations? And, and so over the last number of years, we've been in a bit of a lull as, as we've been working at that. And um, we now have on our executive committee, um, half of our executive committee would be in their 20s and 30s. And um, part of, um, for us, I think, uh, we're not the ones to answer that question of what Anabaptism is going to look like in the future. I think for us, uh, speaking particularly for Mary and I, we're moving into a role now of supporting the younger generation and um, encouraging them, resourcing them, and they're the ones who are going to answer that question about what is Anabaptism going to look like here. Um, I'll have a go at that because I, I have a little bit of a <laughs> another another sort of strand to sort of uh, think about. I, I'm a doctor, and I'm a and very and uh, part of my work in the states was doing cell biology, so I'm I'm, I'm at that level. Uh, but I work as a physician, so I'm, I'm very involved with heart and respiratory respiratory medicine and sleep medicine and this sort of thing. I'm also very aware of cognitive uh, and neurocognitive studies and. I, I think that the, um, the truly, that there's been some really remarkable breakthroughs that are happening all the time, all the way around us, just as we talk about information technology changing, you know, the Apple phone coming in 2007 and, you know, that being, you know, so common now. But in terms of um, neuroscience, we, we, you know, our brain and how our brain coordinates our bodies and how we... All this sort of thing is, is transforming at a rapid rate. And, and when I come back to the message, the message, the, the meaning of what Jesus said, did and was, and how that can be integrated into how we live, I think that, 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 that information and what the meaning of that is needs to be further developed. Because I, I think that what we're talking about is we're talking about Christianity as a way of living, of life, not death. Now, that's different from what I was taught as a child. I was taught that Christianity was a ticket to everlasting life after you died. And that, and that was... What, what it was about. But Anabaptist Christianity is about living. A living God who helps us live. And surely, you know, we have DNA, we now have the, we now have the genome of all of, our, you know, all of our stuff. But we don't have, we don't yet know what is the kind of equivalent to how people live together. Right? And surely God can do that Surely that's it. And, and I sometimes think that when I feel, if I feel joy and peace, and which, I, which I feel is the Holy Spirit in me, communicating with God, that somehow, as a person, I have been biologically made for that to happen. Right? So... So, so what I'm saying is that the, the message, these messages that we get, this information that comes from 2,000 years ago, and, it, and it's, been, it's taken a long time to get here, it's, but I think that message still needs a bit of work. We need to decode it, get rid of the noise, what it is, what it is. And surely, and surely, what the Anabaptist is of sharing and caring for others and peace, a God of, you know, Justice, a God of love. That is, a, that is the essence of life of people. 
Because if you don't have that, then you start down the whole, the whole corridor, the whole... You, Bill talked about a river. Well, this is a flood. Once you start down the other area, you end up with death and violence. Violence and death. Sin, that's, that's the strand that that is. And what, what we're doing, Jesus, you know, incredibly, started this other, the other strand, this strand of life. And surely now, now that humans have entered the, what they call, we now, it's now where humans are controlling the environment of the world. We've entered a new age. You know, before we talked about the different ages. You know, since those, since they, some people say when, when you can measure the plutonium, the plutonium in the, in the soil, that's when man became, had some control over earth. And really, if, and that was only back in, what, 1954, since then, that's when it started. So we, you were probably, some of you weren't alive then, but some of us were. <laughs> but that's, that's when, basically, so the world's changed. And surely the most, the biggest thing that we face now is that man can destroy life. So I think that there's, there, there could well be, and I think this is, a, this is a, something that has to be, you know, <laughs> further developed, because it's just, that, that there is a potential for a vastly different approach. So I'm, I'm with Mary, I'm so well on what you said, and I understand how you're handing the baton on. Um, my challenge is I'm sold on the, what you just said, Sold out, love, looking for community, frustration in. So, what's the next step? Okay. Yeah. Well, can we look at these young people who are taking over the association? I mean, what, what's, I'm a practical person. Yeah, what, what I guess that's, 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 that's my, my thing too. too. What is it? What's the next step? How else, how do we go ahead? Yeah. I don't want to just sit, I want to help. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I tell everybody I know, I tell the churches I go to, I tell our friends, you know. But, and the message is clear, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a reasonably passionate presenter and half articulate, so, you know. Uh, one, of the, yeah, yeah. one of the things, um, let me say a couple things. Usually at the end of all of our conferences, we have a session where it's, where do we go to next? What, what can we do? And, and so we, we try and bring out some of those practical things. But some of this, the practical stuff we've been trying to do, um, in the Sydney area, we're saying, okay, we need to get together some more because we're so spread out. So we, this last year, we started a Friday night once a month where we would come together, Quaker House in the center of Sydney, and we would have speakers or we'd have a film, we'd have times of fellowship because we're saying we need to spend more time together. What we're trying to do, uh, and, and in times past, we, we had uh, people speaking over phone and then had people around both countries joining in. And that what we're encouraging people to do is, uh, for those kind of gatherings, is gather other people in your area who are like-minded. Have a, a table fellowship. And, and for those, we'd say turn into the, the phone conversation. What we're hoping to do now with what we're doing in Sydney, um, through this kind of technology of streaming, we're hoping that this year we can stream those, those times in Sydney and encourage people around the country, uh, both, both countries, um, to gather other people with them, to participate in that, in that streaming conference, have a meal together, um, and then keep the conversation going around the table. And so we're constantly look, looking for ways to start small groups locally where you can gather other people who are like-minded, get together. And so part of the association's uh, goal is and task is how can we resource that and make that happen. So that's what we're hoping to do this next year is to, to stream some of the stuff that's going and encourage people to gather others around and then out of that, who knows uh, what can grow. And part of the thing with the early Anabaptists and even the early church was they did not expect somebody from above to tell them what to do and how to do it. So it's more a matter of a gathered group of believers hearing God and then saying, what is, does that mean about how we are together? And so I think one of the things about community is 
it's hard for me to hear God just alone. Granted, you know, I do think that happens. But I think I get a clearer image about who I'm supposed to be, how we are supposed to be together when we discuss that, when we say, okay, this is my idea. What do you think about it? How does scripture feel, in, feel into that? What's the Holy Spirit's input into that? So once again, I think we need a gathered group of believers in some form to help us even process what this scripture means about the 21st century and how we live here and now. Um. Uh, <clears throat> just to uh, just perhaps go on that thing. So, so I think that the a personal uh, approach to for spiritual growth is very important. And by personal, I mean interacting with another person, either in the way that uh, Bill and Grace described taking up issues and then being able to, 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 to deal with that, but, but from the strength of your Christian. But there's, there is also an enormous yearning for spirituality, and they call it non, non-religious spirituality. And, and I really wonder whether when we feel at peace and joy with the presence of the, of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whether that is touching on something that is built into us, that we yearn for, that we need to, we need to feel. It's a bit like when you care for someone, you actually often have a, a, a tremendous feeling inside. I, I mean, I, I feel I'm in the most, one of the most wonderful professions of all. I'm a doctor, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm able, able to do things to actually help the people. And it's, it's um, my work isn't work. It's, um, <laughs> I don't know what you call it. It's just, service. it's a service, but it's just, it's just great. I, so, and I get a lot of satisfaction about that. So, and I, I think that I'm, 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 I'm coming into that space within. And that's why, that's why I come back to this, this question about the message. Now, now Jesus spoke to people at that time, you know, 2,000 years ago. And he's spoken in um, Ara- Aramaic, Aramaic, yeah. Aramaic. And, um, and, you know, and at that stage, you know, the, um, uh, you know, it, it was just the start of the economic catastrophe that we're involved with now, that, you know, money was, people were being forced off the land and there was, there was all these issues going on. So he, he spoke in that environment and now, now we're in a different environment now, but what he spoke about and what he what he what he did was, I think, it was as relevant to us now as it was then, of course. But but the person, like say my son or or or, or a neighbour, um, maybe a neighbour who now you know it may not have known anything about Christianity, which which could be fortunate, I don't know, but that person. For them to understand the message, the meaning of it, it has to be decoded for them. And when, and when you go into neuroscience, our, our ability, our, it's quite complex. You know, we, we, have, we have many people in us, in a sense, who think different things. Our emotions can make us do things. And just being able to understand our own selves and, and be in control of our own self is it's an extraordinary thing. And, but that is happening now. There is starting to now develop ways that people can help control their, themselves. We see it in people with psychiatric disorders. You know, you know the, the whole myth of a drug fixing up is, is slowly going away because that's, you know, the brain is much more capable of recovery. But there is, there, there is a way of, of helping people with their thinking and their emotions, which is actually deeply satisfying to them. So, there's a, so, so it comes back to, I think, that there still needs to be things developed. So the association, it's hard, it's hard to sort of, um, uh, for one person to be able to do this, but, but if the message and the decoding of the message and getting rid of the noise in the system, if a group is sort of helping, to that, helping that to be done, and, that, and sometimes that is as good as the stories that you tell the stories that you tell, you know, on the train or, or in the community. I mean, those, because most people will understand stories, but they, 
So I think there's a, there, there are other things that can be done to actually foster that. Yeah. Sorry. I think we're out of time. Yeah, we're out of time. Okay. I want to thank you very much. So if you do have more questions, um, Mary and I are, are often around the table back here, and there's plenty of literature and stuff. And, but also, if you've got ideas, bring us ideas. Um, and Sunday, we're going to talk about where to. And so any ideas you have, we're open. And if you're not on our mailing list, we do a, a weekly mailing that has um, articles but also tells about local events and we encourage people in other areas to send us uh, information about local events so that we can publicize them and encourage people wherever they are to get together and find like-minded folks so okay i would just like to say thank you since the three of you are up there because you really caught the uh the spirit of the idea that, that we could maybe call this thing called the community and just um, I just felt a real uh, energy um, you know among the executive committee and and so on and um, I think that's where it starts is the energy and then the simple message Jesus said I am the way the life and the truth and and I'm sure you know that if we go out with that message and we try to find people who want to figure out what does that actually mean you know we'll come together and so just thank you so much for everything you've done to bring us all together. <laughs>